Bob Crinsley, and I'm here to tell you the incredible story of how personal computers took over the world. Why am I telling you this at a basketball game? Well, I like the game, but mainly it's because of that guy down there. His name is Paul Allen, and everything you see here belongs to him. The Portland Trailblazers basketball team, their arena, even the dancers. Thanks to personal computers, he has $8 billion to spend on such toys. 20 years ago, Allen and his high school friend Bill Gates were running a two-man software company called Microsoft. Today, Allen is richer than God, and Gates is richer than Allen. 20 years ago, young men like Paul Allen and Bill Gates invented the personal computer and in doing so launched a revolution that's changed the way we live, work, and communicate. It's hard to believe that 20 years ago there were no personal computers. Now it's the third largest industry in the world, somewhere between energy production and the illegal drugs. But the most amazing thing of all is that it happened by accident because a bunch of disenfranchised nerds wanted to impress their friends. This is the story of how a handful of guys launched an industrial revolution, how they changed the culture of business, how they made history. I feel incredibly lucky to be at exactly the right place in Silicon Valley, at exactly the right time historically where this invention has, has taken form. It wasn't like we both thought it was going to go a long ways. It was like we both do it for fun. And even though we're going to lose some money, probably, we'll just have been able to say we had a company. All of us would get together and just hope we were right, that the PC would become a big thing. You know, I stop and say, wow, the PC really has become part of the very fabric, the way people live. And we certainly surged with it. And I just stop and say, hmm, pretty incredible ride. Most of these people come from the place I call home, the Silicon Valley south of San Francisco, California. Growing up here near the electronics companies that give the place its name, these founders of the PC revolution were, for the most part, middle-class white kids from good suburban homes. But it's not their homes we're interested in. It's their garages. This is my garage, and this is all my junk. I'm probably one of the few guys in Silicon Valley who actually has room in his garage for a car. Most everyone else seems to use theirs to start computer companies and create great fortunes. But I don't have a fortune. I'm a failure. I've written computer programs that almost ran, and I've designed and built hardware devices that frankly didn't work at all. But I'm the ideal guy to tell the story of the personal computer business because I'm its premier gossip columnist. And everyone tells me all their secrets. And this is my home, where I write a gossip column for a computing magazine. Sorry about the mess. Institutions in constant change like the PC industry are driven by rumor and gossip, and I thrive on both. My electronic mail address is deluged with inside information about everything from product flaws to who's sleeping with whom. What ties these gossipers together is a desire for truth. These people and their love of technology have fueled the PC revolution. To understand them is to understand that revolution. So let's go find some. Meet Edwin Chin on a Saturday morning at the Weird Stuff Warehouse. This could be 1976 or 1996, because there is always a new generation of techies like Edwin who hear the calling. Most other kids are watching TV, but not Edwin. You know, I'm interested in electronics and technologies and a hobby since I started when I was like 
six or seven, you know. How old are you now, Edwin? Ten, right now. It's no coincidence that the only woman in the vicinity looks bored. Because this is a boy thing. The obsession of a particular type of boy who would rather struggle with an electronic box than with a world of unpredictable people. We call them engineers, programmers, hackers, and techies. But mainly, we call them nerds. I think a nerd is a person who uses the telephone to talk to other people about telephones. And a computer nerd, therefore, is somebody who uses a computer in order to use a computer. And people have like different degrees of passion, different types of passion. You know, some people like they just like live databases and like fifth normal form is just like nirvana and like they just quest for it, you know. Like that's like what gets them up in the morning. What do your friends think of you? Boy, he's a nerd. Yeah. But I don't mind. I'm used to being called a nerd. Can't have other people stop your dreams. You've got a very wide wire. And in Silicon Valley, the dream is to grow up to become a boy like this. It doesn't make any difference at all to you whether it's on one of these machines. Graham Spencer is chief programmer for Architects Software. Six guys who graduated from Stanford University and started a company just because they like each other. This is a modern day startup. But at heart, it's no different from PC pioneers like Apple or Microsoft, nerds who share a dream. Their hobby is their business, and the culture they've created is identical to that of a thousand other technology companies. First, they dumped the idea of nine to five. In this industry, you can work any 80 hours per week you like. Uh, and then I've got my, my cap, which I use to cover my eyes and oh, yes. sleep in the early morning while everybody's coming in. We didn't even obey a 24-hour clock. We'd come in and program for a couple days straight. Uh, we'd, uh, you know, four or five of us, when it was time to eat, we'd all get in our cars and kind of race over to the restaurant and sit and talk about what we were doing. Sometimes I'd get excited talking about things I'd forget to eat, but then you know, we'd just go back and program some more. It was us and our friends. Those were fun days. Let's look in the refrigerator. Whoa, we have Coke and uh, cold pizza. I drink about two liters of Coke a day. I two guess. liters of Coke a day. Yeah. And, and do, you, do you think of it like as brain food? That keeps me going, that and, uh, you know, listen to heavy metal and get caffeinated and, and hack. I'd sit down in my room on the floor with sheets of paper spread all around with my computer design I was working on, and always I noticed that I was up pretty late at night and I had lots of Cokes, just part of, it's part of that life. Combination of stale pizza and body odor and sort of spilt cola kind of ground into the rug. I had brought some spaghetti to work and then forgot to wash out the container for the last couple of days, maybe six or seven, if I had to be honest. Ooh, that smells bad. <laughs> <laughs> Eating, bathing, having a girlfriend, having an active social life is incidental. It gets in the way of code time. You know, writing code is, is the primary force that drives our lives, so... Anything that interrupts that is, is wasteful. What is it about the internal logic of a computer that's so enticing? For one thing, such logic can be understood, as opposed to things that can't be understood at all, like the motivations of young women, say, or of the French. Let me explain. Time for the Cringely Crash Course in Basic Computers, Part 1. This is a mainframe computer. All of these cabinets are one machine. In the old days, all computers were this size. They were tended by engineers in white coats, a kind of priesthood who took their jobs very seriously. Now, all computers work pretty much the same, whether it's a giant that serves 2,000 users like this one or a little notebook that serves only me. They process numerical data, adding, multiplying, comparing. Fact is, if you can quantify it, a computer can handle it. It's the emotional stuff they don't know what to do with.